This morning I am pleased to say that we are taking up our study in the Gospel according to Luke. And so if you have a Bible with you, please turn to Luke chapter 11. The last Sunday was Easter, and then before that we had a little three-week series dealing with some of the challenges that we are facing due to the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we had messages dealing with anxiety, uh, isolation, and patience. The audio of those uh, messages is available on our website, and the video videos are available at our YouTube channel. And they are there as a resource if you feel like you need a reminder of what God says about those things in the weeks to come. Before the coronavirus came along and disrupted our life together as a church in our Sunday morning services, uh, we were in the final section of Luke chapter 11, a section that runs from verse 37 to verse 54. And this section describes a meal that Jesus had in the home of a Pharisee. In our last sermon, we looked at just verse 37, and we meditated on the fact that Jesus was willing to eat with a Pharisee, even though the Pharisees were his most strident opponents. Accepting this man's invitation, going into his house, sitting at his table was an act of grace. And it shows us that Jesus loves sinners of every kind and wants to bring them to repentance. Now this morning we're going to begin looking at what unfolded around the meal table. Our text is Luke chapter 11 verses 37 to 41. But I'm going to read all the way down to the end of the chapter. So please, if you would, follow along in your Bible as I read aloud. Luke chapter 11 beginning at verse 37. And as he, that's Jesus, spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him, and he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? But rather give alms as such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees! For ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs, and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Woe unto you, Pharisees, for ye love the uppermost seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are as graves which appear not, and the men walk over them, are not aware of them. Then answered one of the lawyers, and said unto him, Master, thus saying thou reproachest us also. And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be borne, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe unto you, for ye build the sepulchres of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. Truly ye bear witness that ye allow the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and ye build their sepulchres. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute, that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Woe unto you, lawyers! For ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently, and to provoke him to speak of many things, laying wait for him, and seeking to catch something out of his mouth, that they might accuse him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray and commit our time of preaching to the Lord. 
Heavenly Father, thank you that you have called us together into the fellowship of your Son. Thank you that though we are separated from each other today, we are united forever in him. Thank you for sending your Spirit into our hearts to comfort us and guide us along this pilgrim way. We ask now that your Spirit would help us to understand the text of Scripture before us this morning. May he instruct us, encourage us and correct us if that be our need. Please do a good work in us by your word. And this we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. As I said, our text for this morning is verses 37 to 41. And we're going to consider this passage under four headings. Uh, you can see that if you have a copy of the outline in front of you. Otherwise, you, you might want to jot these down. First of all, we're going to see a deliberate omission. Then number two, a disproportionate response. Then number three, a devastating assessment. And then finally, a divine reminder. A deliberate omission, a disproportionate response, a devastating assessment, and then a divine reminder. And so, first of all, let's see a deliberate omission. In verse 38, we're told what got the conversation going around the Pharisees' dinner table. It was something that Jesus didn't do before he sat down to eat. The Pharisee noticed that he had not first washed before dinner. Now what we have to understand here is that this washing was not primarily for hygienic purposes. This was a ceremonial washing that the Pharisees and other very devout Jews practiced before eating. And it was not a washing that was required in the Mosaic Law. This was one of the traditions that had arisen over time. Now, sometimes these traditions were specific ways that the Jewish people believed the Mosaic law was to be applied. Uh, a law in the book of Leviticus, for example, commanded one thing. And over time, there might have developed a whole set of guidelines about how specifically that law was to be applied in everyday life. As Jewish thought progressed over the centuries, the authority of those guidelines grew until they were believed by some sections in Judaism to be binding, to be laws themselves. And so for the Pharisees, like the Orthodox Jews today, you had the law, you know, what God gave to Moses, and you had the traditions, this other body of law that was eventually codified and written down in the 5th and 6th centuries, and is known today as the Talmud. Now, some of these traditions were also believed to have been passed down orally. There was a belief that when God gave the law to Moses at Mount Sinai, the written law, he also gave Moses, and perhaps the, the elders as well, additional commandments that were not written down. And these were binding on God's people as well. It was one of these traditions that Jesus failed to follow when he did not wash his hands before eating. And it's very interesting because you can go to the Talmud today and find instructions about the exact amount of water that one is supposed to use when washing their hands before a meal. As I said, this was not so much about hygiene as it was about being fastidious in the area of ceremonial cleanliness. One scholar suggests that the idea behind this was that you might have dust on your hands and that dust might have been in contact with the Gentile and therefore you might be unclean and so to be absolutely sure you would wash your hands before sitting down to eat. And I suspect in this case it was something that you did in a ceremonial kind of way. Uh, you, you didn't pop down the hall to the bathroom. Uh, perhaps a basin of water and a towel was pro provided for you to wash your hands in view of those who you were going to eat with. Now Jesus didn't follow this tradition on this occasion. He, he didn't wash his hands and I don't think it was because he 
forgot. Uh, I don't think it was an oversight. And he must have not washed his hands in such a way that his host noticed. Now maybe as people were filing into the house, a bowl was offered to them and each took a turn. And uh, as Jesus came into the room, he didn't. It was obvious. Or perhaps before the meal was served, a bowl was offered while the guests were reclining at the table. And when the servant came to Jesus with that bowl, Jesus politely declined. The point is that Jesus meant to do this. He meant for it to be noticed because he knew it would provoke a response. He knew this would provide an opportunity for him to get to the heart of his host, to minister to him the words that he needed to hear. It would provide an opportunity to get to the core of the problem that plagued the Pharisees as a whole. I also think that by not washing his hands, Jesus was communicating an important message about the traditions themselves, about their authority. Obviously, Jesus, knowing that they were man-made laws and not from God, did not see them as binding. He didn't see them as having authority. He did a similar thing in Luke chapter 6 when the disciples picked some grain on the Sabbath day to eat. Now Jesus pushed back against the Pharisees who claimed that the disciples had done something unlawful by going against one of the traditions. And so first of all, this was a deliberate omission and it elicited... A disproportionate response. And that's the second heading in our outline. Verse 38. When the Pharisee saw it, he marveled. He was, he was stunned. <laughs> he was amazed that Jesus didn't wash his hands. Now his response wasn't disproportionate for a Pharisee. Uh, this is how we would expect a Pharisee to respond. Uh, this is what Jesus was expecting. He knew how the Pharisees were wired. <laughs> he knew how the Pharisees thought. He knew what was important to them. It wasn't disproportionate for a Pharisee, but in God's economy, it was. In the realm of truth, it was. And it was so because it demonstrated two things. Number one, it demonstrated the Pharisees gave far too much weight to the traditions. It demonstrated that they had imbued them with divine authority that they did not have, for they were the traditions of men. All Jesus had done was fail to observe a man-made rule, not the law of God. But the Pharisee behaved as if Jesus had transgressed the law of God. He was so gravenly mistaken and lost. And then number two, his response demonstrated a misguided and exaggerated concern with outward observance, as if that was what primarily made a person righteous. And this is exactly what Jesus went on to address. And so we come to the third heading in our outline, a devastating assessment. And before we get to what Jesus said in verses 39 and 40, I want you to notice the way that Luke refers to Jesus. Now we've seen it before in our study, but it's worth pointing out again. Luke calls Jesus the Lord. The Lord said unto him. The Greek word is kurios. It's the word we find in the Greek translation of the Old Testament whenever the divine name Yahweh is mentioned. Capital L-O-R-D in our English translation of the Old Testament. Now Luke, by referring to Jesus using this term, is making the connection back to the Old Testament. He is saying that Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus is God. His original readers, whose Bible was the Greek translation of the Old Testament, would have realised exactly what Luke was doing. They would have realised exactly the claim that Luke was making about Jesus' identity. And it's a very important point 
that we must not miss. Now what the Lord said to this Pharisee and to the others who were present at this meal was very direct and very strong. He confronted them about their focus on outward observance at the expense of their inner lives. Verse 39, the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisees make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness. In other words, Jesus was saying, you Pharisees are so concerned about matters like washing hands and washing cups and plates. You are so concerned about cleanliness on the outside, but inside you're filthy. You're full of greed and all kinds of sin. And then Jesus went a step further. He confronted their thinking. He confronted their, their mindset he called them fools. Verse 40, Ye fools, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? <laughs> Are you so stupid as to think that the one who made your body did not also make your soul? Are you so stupid as to think that God only cares about the outside and not the inside? This was the heart of the problem for the Pharisees, their hearts. They believed that their outward commitment to the law and to the traditions made them righteous and holy. They kept all of the ceremonial laws and the dietary laws. They prayed and fasted and washed and tithed better than anyone else. But all the while... They allowed sin to fester in the inner man. Jesus said exactly the same thing in his public denunciation of the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23, verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. I can imagine some of the Pharisees around that table choking on their lunch when Jesus said this. I can see them straightening up. I can see stunned looks on all of their faces. What did he just say? What did he just call us? Fools? Oh yes, these were very sharp words from the lips of our Lord. They show us that Jesus did not suffer from the fear of man. Uh, they show us that he was unafraid to speak the unvarnished truth and it was exactly what these particular men needed to hear. The Pharisees would never enter the kingdom of God until they saw the foolishness of their thinking. Until they realised that all of their religious effort was in vain, that it did not make them righteous in God's eyes. Jesus spoke truth that was intended to bring them to repentance as hard as that would have been for them. But Jesus didn't just confront them. He also showed them the way, the way of life, the way to be truly right with God. And so we come to the fourth and final heading in our outline. We've seen a deliberate omission, a disproportionate response, a devastating assessment now we see a divine reminder. I've called what Jesus said in verse 41 a reminder because that's what it was. It was not new truth, not a, a new revelation. And I'll show you that in a moment, but let's think through the text because it is a bit tricky. Verse 41, but rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. It's curious that Jesus introduces the concept of alms into this conversation. Uh, the word alms refers to works of mercy. Uh, often in the New Testament it refers to money given to the poor. And I think Jesus was drawing a very pointed contrast. He was contrasting the Pharisees' commitment to ceremony 
with what was really important. Uh, the laws call for compassion, a ceremony, compassion. This compassion was part of the, the weightier matters, as Jesus calls them in Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. The weightier matters, things like mercy, you know, caring for the poor and the oppressed. Now, instead of being so focused on the outward observances of your traditions, give alms of such things as ye have, the verse says. Now here we come to an expression that's a bit difficult to interpret because this is the only time it's found in the New Testament. Uh, allow me to explain. The expression, such things as ye have, is just two words in the original language, ta enonta. And this is the only occurrence of the word enonta in the New Testament. So this is a very rare occasion where we can't compare scripture with scripture to help us ascertain the meaning. Now, the dictionary definition of the word is to be within. So Jesus is saying, gives, uh, give arms of or from within. Now, the question is, within what? Give arms from within? <laughs> well, from within what? Now Jesus is saying either give alms of that which is within your house or he's saying give alms of that which is within you. Now given what we've seen in verses 39 and 40, I believe the context clearly favours the second interpretation. Give alms of that which is within you. Give alms of such things that you have inside of you from your heart. You see, that's what Jesus was driving at, wasn't he? The condition of these men's heart. That's what mattered most. And then Jesus added, If you do that, if you give arms of that which is within you, behold, all things are clean unto you. And what does that mean? <laughs> Uh, was Jesus saying that if you perform genuine, heartfelt works of mercy, then you will be clean? Uh, you won't have to be so concerned about all of the ceremonies and the washings and so forth. Uh, was Jesus saying that sincere works of mercy make a person clean and righteous? Well, is that it? Well, no, I don't think so. Because that would still leave the Pharisees and us in the realm of religion in the realm of justification by our own works, which was completely at odds with what Jesus taught, completely at odds with the Gospel. So what was Jesus saying in verse 41? I think once again, our dear friend J.C. Ryle helps us understand, uh, listen to his thoughts on this verse. The simplest sense of this sentence appears to be Give first the offering of the inward man. Give your heart, your affections, and your will to God as the first great alms you bestow. And then all your other actions, proceeding from a right heart, are an acceptable sacrifice, a clean offering in the sight of God. If I can use more modern terminology... Jesus was challenging these men about their heart relationship to God. He was urging them to address their spiritual lives. He was talking about the substance of their hearts, what was going on inside of them, their thoughts, their attitudes, their desires, their love, their worship, their, their trust. That They needed to give of that as alms as something ac acceptable to God, something that would bless God. And if they were doing that, if their heart relationship with God was right, the works of their hands would be clean. That's how a truly righteous life operates from the inside out. Now, God had always wanted the hearts of his people. 
And I describe Jesus' words here as a reminder because they really were another way of communicating to these men the first and great commandment. The commandment that had been on their lips since they could speak their confession of faith. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. As I said, God had always wanted the hearts of his people. This wasn't a new revelation to these Pharisees, it was a reminder. If God didn't have their hearts, then it mattered not one whit how often they washed their hands or gave their tithes or offered their sacrifices on the altar. And this was a problem way back in Isaiah's day. Isaiah chapter 29 verse 13. For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honour me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. That was the problem in Isaiah's day. And this was the problem in Jesus' day. This is exactly what he confronted at this Pharisee's dinner table. These religious men had forgotten the central tenet of their law, of the, of the faith they claimed to be so devoted to. In our next sermon, we'll look at what Jesus went on to say. He certainly didn't let up. If anything, his condemnation grew stronger. But for now, I, I want to connect what Jesus said here to our Christian lives. Because there is something here for us. Now, we need to recognise that these men in our text, the Pharisees, did not believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. They were not regenerate. They were dead in trespasses and sins. What Jesus said to them in this passage was intended to convict them of their sin. It was intended to convict them of their lost condition. It was intended to bring them to repentance and faith. Bring them to eternal life. And so for we who know Christ as Saviour, we have, as it were, already got the message. We've heard Christ's words in the Gospels. And by his grace we've repented we acknowledged our sin and we stopped trusting in ourselves. We stopped trusting in our own righteousness and we trusted in Christ. But that does not inoculate us against ever having the kind of attitude or the kind of piety that we see in the Pharisees. Even as Christians, we can think that we're okay because we're doing all the right things outwardly while inwardly our heart is cold and selfish. The classic example of this in the New Testament is the church at Ephesus. And please, if you would turn over to the book of Revelation, chapter 2. The book of Revelation, chapter 2. And I'd like to read the first five verses. Here we have a letter that Jesus wrote to the church at Ephesus. The word of God says, And unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labour, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast laboured, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works." Or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. 
that the Christians that made up this local church at Ephesus were outstanding in so many ways. Jesus, in this letter to them, acknowledges their works, their patience, and their stand against false apostles and you know, false teachers. They had laboured in his name and had not fainted. You know, I imagine if we had visited this church, we would have been impressed by the clarity and forthrightness of the teaching, by the commitment to sound doctrine, and we'd probably have been impressed by all of the activity, the instruction for children, the, the care for the widows and the poor, you know, so many people serving in, in different ways. We'd probably have come away thinking that we, we wished our church was more like the church at Ephesus. But what did Jesus say to them? Revelation chapter 2 verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You don't love me like you used to. Your heart has grown cold and indifferent towards me, and I hold that against you. Now the cup was clean and shiny on the outside, but on the inside, the situation was very different. Had these Christians forgotten that he that made that which is without also made that which is within? And this happens when Christians neglect their inner life. When they don't keep their hearts warm for Jesus with the gospel and with prayer, with Bible reading and meditation and with the fellowship of the saints. It happens when cultivating our relationship with Christ gets pushed down the list of priority or when it fades into the background. That, that's what Jesus was getting at when he told the church at Ephesus to repent and do the first works, the, do the basic things, the things these Christians delighted in doing when they first came to know Jesus, when the flame of love was first kindled. Now I realise that it's a bit harder at the moment. Maybe it's a lot harder because we can't meet together and, and have that heartwarming fellowship in person. We can't sing together and, and pray together and be encouraged by the word together. But even so, let me ask you very directly, are you keeping your heart warm for Jesus? Or is this season of isolation slowly eating away your love for him and your zeal for his kingdom? Is it the case that it's not the things of earth that are growing strangely dim? He is. I get it. <laughs> I understand how this can happen. It's as though for some of us this season of disruption and restriction has caused the pull of the world and the desires of the flesh to become stronger than ever. And our hearts can pursue all of that, try to find satisfaction and escape in what the world has to offer at the expense of our relationship with Christ. We can become outwardly one thing, but inwardly something very different. I hope that's not happening in your life. But please, by God's grace, don't let it happen. And if it has, listen to Christ's message to his church. Repent and do the first works. Now, brothers and sisters, let us love Christ, the Lord our God, with all our heart, soul, mind and strength. This is the first and great commandment. Let us keep our hearts warm for Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word as it has come to us today. Please help us to receive and inwardly digest what you have said. 
please help us to obey. We love you, Father. We love your Son, our Saviour. And we want that love to grow more and more each day. We pray for grace to this end. And this we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. May the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.